greetings everyone and welcome to the Argonaut monthly video covering October 2023. Well, poet T.S. Eliot said that April is the cruelest month, but he was talking about flower beds. Every investor knows that it is in fact October that is the cruelest month. And it all started in 1907 with the bank panic in New York, where John Pierpoint Morgan, Mr. J.P. Morgan himself, stepped in to save the day, leading to the creation of the Federal Reserve as the banker of last resort. Then in October 1929, we had the most famous crash of all time, the Wall Street crash, Black Thursday, when the market lost 11% in a day. That was followed by Black Monday, where it lost 12%, and then Black Tuesday, where it lost another 12%. And then, of course, October 1987, October the 19th, the darkest day in stock market history, which saw markets crash more than 20% in just one day. And this was, the, this was the granddaddy of all market crashes. So in view of what happened in October 1907, 1929 and 1987, cheer up everyone, this October could have been a lot worse. And of course, like my favorite singer-songwriter, Billy Ocean, we at Argonaut enjoy it more when the going gets tough. Coincidentally, on that day of the 1987 crash, there was also a massive storm in the UK, which celebrity weatherman Michael Fish famously said Britain would avoid and not to worry about. Wind is, of course, a theme that we can't get away from nowadays, and we will come back to later in the video. So what has happened since our last video? Well, October was the third month in a row for negative equity and bond markets with global markets down 3% on average. Despite the conflict in the Middle East, oil also finished down 9% on the month. We saw a very positive GDP print in the US with third quarter GDP rising 4.9% year on year or 8.4% in nominal terms. During the month, the 10-year US Treasury uh, ro rose above 5% yield for the first time since 2007. And we also saw central banks hold interest rates. So the Federal Reserve at 5.5, the ECB at 4, and the Bank of England at 5.25. But we did see the, uh, the Bank of Japan now say they weren't going to defend 1% yields on Japanese government bonds. Now, Consensus is that the Fed is done hiking rates and there'll be a significant slowdown in Q4 GDP and that will boost uh, long duration assets. And, and we're not sure about that. Companies started to report Q3 earnings. Volatility on a stock level was high with companies reporting poor results getting punished and vice versa. This is great for stock pickers that can sort the weed out from the chaff. And... Although equities, bonds, and commodities all delivered negative returns, like a phoenix from the flames, the Argonaut Absolute Return Fund was up 7.5%, which is an abnormally good month, but demonstrating, I think, once again, the value of an uncorrelated return. How did we do this? Well, our longs were actually up on average 2%, which was great. And our shorts were down an average of 13%. So most of our returns from our shorts, but we also managed to, to generate some positive returns from our longs. I think it's worth noting that our short book generates the uncorrelated nature of our returns. There will be months where we lose money on our shorts and the market goes up, which might result in uncorrelated losses. But the whole point of the fund is most investors already have too much exposure to the overall market direction. And therefore, what we do is fairly unique and is a great diversifier for people's portfolios. So please read uh, our monthly fact sheet for more details. Let's now return to the US fiscal deficit, which to my mind is both the reason why the US isn't yet in recession but also why we are returning to a bear market for risk assets as all other investments are crowded out by the need to feed the beast or finance the deficit. 
So let's look at US public finances in more detail. The, the year end for the US government is September. So the accounts are in, they've been filed, and we can see what the government spent and what it uh, took in taxes for the year to September 2023. So federal spending increased by 11% to 6.5 trillion, while tax receipts were just 4.4 trillion. So this means the deficit was 2.1 trillion on an underlying basis. Although Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen claimed that Treasury yields uh, going higher were a reflection of a stronger economy this month, we think they are actually a consequence of fiscal recklessness with this 8% fiscal deficit reported for 2023, which is, of course, comes at comes at a time of, of high inflation, of full employment, when the Federal Reserve are actually trying to slow the economy, the government is trying to stimulate it. So the market is now debating the extent of the GDP slowdown in Q4 from this very strong number in Q3, with bad or at least less strong economic data now seen as positive for risk assets because it would provide uh, some relief on rates. But with an election next year, we think it's likely that this reckless spending continues. And that means the economy might be more resilient with higher inflation and higher interest rates than what the market is currently anticipating. So this government spending stimulates the economy in the short term, albeit without the multiplier effects from infrastructure investment uh, Keynes envisage, since the increases in spending are largely for Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, and subsidizing renewable energy. But this comes at the expense of productivity growth and private capital. So without this rest, reckless fiscal spending, the economy would have already slowed down and the global financial system would have already had lower rates. But many investors today will have only started investing post the great financial crisis in 2008 uh, and only seen for most of that time, really one market regime of, of economic, uh, anemic economic growth, very low interest rates, which was very helpful for what we call long duration assets or assets that are basically getting most of their value from, from the future, and hence uh, generally growth stocks, but also uh, long-term government bonds and, and long duration assets in general. It seems to me, and this is why we came out with a video on the 1970s redux early last year, that we're now in a different market regime where the opposite is true. And this will cause a wealth transfer out of long duration assets, which did well uh, for most of the last decade, and actually into short duration assets, which previously performed poorly. And we think this regime shift is likely to last years rather than months. So from the, the, 90, the early 1980s until the financial crisis of 2008, governments stepped back from involvement in the economy. And as a result of the wisdom of markets and the invisible hand, uh, in economies and investors flourish. But let's now look at how governments have been getting bigger and how unsustainable this all is. We will talk about the US, but in fact, the same thing has happened in the UK. So in the US, net debt held, uh, government debt held by the public was 26 and a half trillion, equivalent to 98% of GDP, and just shy of the record of 104% in 1945 in the accounts that the federal government just filed. And you could say that all of this extra debt rather than productivity has funded most of the economic growth for the last. 15 years, because in 2007, actually debt to GDP was just 35%. So this is an extraordinary uh, uh, gearing of government balance sheets and a real change from the type of responsible fiscal uh, governments that we had for most of the 1980s, 1990s and the noughties. And I think the problem is that we now have a political culture where more government seems the answer to every problem. And we know that governments are less efficient at allocating capital than private investors and less good at choosing how to spend their money on than private consumers. 
So governments displacing the invisible hand of free markets is not good for productivity. Government debt or how government finances its economic interventions is now at levels which are unsustainable, particularly without central banks buying it, which of course happened between 2009 and 2021. And central banks were essentially printing money to finance the deficits. Now, net interest on the public debt in the US last oh, in 2023 was 711 billion or 11% of total spending. But as treasury debt is refinanced across the yield curve, and remember, uh, this is a process which will you know, take years rather than months or days. As it's refinanced across the yield curve at interest rates of above 5%, the annual interest bill will rise towards 1.3 trillion. So if you took all that debt and applied a 5% cost, you would get a figure of 1.3 trillion, which is in fact 30% of current tax receipts. Now, the 1 trillion drawdown on the reverse repo facility, which is essentially money markets parking their, their, their cash at the Federal Reserve uh, and putting it back into US debt has helped recent treasury issuance, which has been largely at the short end of the curve with, with issuance of, of bills of uh, less than uh, 12 months. But the problem that the treasury has is there is a distinct lack of buyers for longer term treasury debt Central banks are doing QT rather than QE. Commercial banks have been burnt in long duration assets. And those governments, particularly in Asia, that had big trade surpluses that were recycling them back into treasuries such as China and Japan are no longer doing that. Now, at the end of last month, legendary hedge fund investor Stanley Druckenmiller took aim at Secretary, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Yellen saying that um, during and post-COVID, when rates were practically zero, every Tom, Dick, Harry and Sally, and even his golf club club caddy and locker room attendant were extending their debt maturities and Yellen did nothing. And this was the biggest blunder in the history of the Treasury. Well, I think there's some truth to that, but I think we've also got to think about without quantitative easing or central banks buying government debt, and especially with quantitative tightening, so central banks actually selling their debt, so the Fed is selling about a trillion of, of treasuries a year at the moment, not only does the ownership of the treasury market need to change from public to private, thus crowding out all other asset classes, which have got to be sold to pay for this uh, private ownership, increase in private ownership of, of treasuries, but the cost of financing the fiscal recklessness can quickly become unsustainable. So um, the end game here is either a fiscal reckoning, which causes a hard landing as, as, as governments cut their cloth accordingly, or it requires central banks to step back in and start doing quantitative easing again, start monetizing the debt, and that will cause inflation to accelerate. And we would say that neither end game is an enticing prospect for investors. So let's return to a favorite topic of ours, ESG. Well, this month we published a new blog uh, and documentary video on wind power, specifically offshore wind power, entitled Britain's a goner with the wind. Now let's recap a few important points. Well, I think there's a general belief uh, based, I think, on if you repeat something often enough, people start to believe it, that wind is cheap because of the way the CFD auction results have been reported. The average cost of wind power generation, the guaranteed price that governments are insisting uh, the grid pays for wind power, is currently on average above £100 per megawatt hour in the UK, which is twice the cost of gas. Now, since 2017, there have been CFD auctions that have been reported in the press as low as £37. But that is not the price at which uh, wind farms actually sell the, the power back to the grid, because that is the price based on 2012 prices that are subsequently adjusted upward 
for inflation. So by the time the wind farm starts producing power, the cost of that power to the grid is significantly higher than the, the headline CFD price. And in addition to that, the wind farms that won the auctions at these very low head, headline prices aren't actually being built because the wind operators have said that they won't now be profitable enough. So this idea that just because there was a headline uh, price of, of £37 in a CFD auction, that's what all wind farms are producing winder is is absolute poppycock now weather dependent power particularly at high market share is not a, a a useful economic product it's not useful for the electricity grid and when we say it's useless it is because we already have a glut of wind power when the wind blows that can't be profitably stored or exported so we don't need any more of it. And then I think thirdly, in a free market, no more wind would be built because government the, the government, by guaranteeing an artificially high price, means that the wind operators don't care that the product is useless. So it's the poor consumer that ends up paying the bill through higher electricity prices. And these bills will, I'm afraid, rise exponentially as more wind power is built. So it's not, it's wind becomes incrementally more useless the more of it you build. And I think that's the important point. We also published a follow up blog specifically at Troubles at Orsted, the world's largest offshore wind company, outlining why we think the company, despite all of these subsidies and UK government support and carbon taxes raising the, the, the price of the competitive product, has, in our view, questionable equity value and will likely end up getting bailed out by the Danish and the UK governments, which I think rather highlights the economically rent-seeking, parasitical nature of the wind industry. Government does everything for it. It could possibly do to make it succeed, but it still fails, and it fails because wind power is a poor product and it's exponentially poor at higher market shares. So November has started with a bounce in bonds and equities based on the idea that interest rates have peaked. We're not sure this lasts. Interest rates are still at dangerously high altitude. Government spending uh, can't be sustainably funded by private capital markets, so something's got to give. So markets are currently anticipating a significant slowdown in GDP, which will ease the pressure from rates and be good for long duration assets. Uh, I think a significant slowdown in GDP will also obviously hit corporate earnings, which will, won't be necessarily good for equities. But I think we're a long way from central banks panicking and cutting rates. The Argonaut Absolute Return Fund is now up double digits for the fifth calendar year in a row, which is unique amongst the 4,000 or so funds in the UK fund management industry. And I would also say that during these five calendar years, we've actually made more than 100% of our returns uh, in negative market months, which is important because we deliver when other funds don't, and of course, vice versa, which highlights that we blend well with other funds dependent on market direction, whether active or passive. And I think that will be pretty important going forward. 